Hey there model builders, if you found this video, chances are you are looking for a review on Edward's new Tora 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 boxing of the A6 M2 Mitsubishi Zero. And if you don't have much time on your hands, I'll sum it up in one word. Awesome. But if you have about 20 minutes on your hand, let's dive deeper. Still here? Alright, let's get going then. The Tora 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 boxing included some additional pages in the instructions that give you some background on the attack at Pearl Harbor, and some information on the A6 M2 Zero. The kit contains parts to make two models, but Edward set me up with some more goodies like a 3D printed seat, look panel, included some resin tires as well, including the tail wheel, T-face mask to do the inside and outside canopies, there's space set for the cockpit as well, and an extra set of stencils. The dials on the look panel were raised and a little more clear than the space set, so I ended up going with that for the first build. As it turns out, that panel is not exactly needed because the detail in the cockpit for these zeros is extremely well done. The one advantage of the 3D printed seat is there's a little more detail on the back of it and in the front. And when I installed that 3D printed seat, it dropped right into place with no issues. You just have to use super glue to secure it to the styrene. Compared to resin casting, which has been the popular method before for producing aftermarket parts, 3D printing is a faster process that's allowing more manufacturers to provide additional parts for kits. So we won't be surprised when manufacturers like Edward are able to bring more products to market faster. When building this kit, I chose to not follow the instructions when it came to assembling the cockpit. And the reason for that is I like to have everything in place prior to painting. And I also wanted to add some more detail to the sidewalls using lead wire. If I had have assembled the cockpit according to the instructions, it would have been very difficult to paint everything and then put the wiring in afterwards. So I took a little bit of a risk and it turns out that this way of assembling the model kit doesn't provide any real challenges or difficulties. Speaking of challenges, if keeping photo etch items in place is something you find difficult, one trick I use is gluing styrene temporarily in place to hold the photo etch while it dries, and that's just a matter afterwards of popping the styrene out of place. In some areas of the cockpit, I used telescoping brass rod in order to build what looked like valves and assemblies for the wiring and hydraulics of the cockpit. Although this isn't a 100% accurate layout of the wiring and hydraulics in the cockpit, I'm putting enough in just to make it look busier. This is something that any modeler can do just simply using lead wire and some super glue. I also use the brass rod to simulate where the rudder cables will be running under the cockpit floor. It might look messy right now, but again, Debonder will clean up all that black super glue that's visible. Don't be intimidated. Detailing a cockpit may be as simple as adding a throttle cable and starting with that. The next thing you know, you'll actually be using Easy Line to build the bungee system for the seat. So start small and don't be afraid to try. I like adding extra detail to the cockpit because that's one of the first areas your eye is drawn to when looking at a built kit. Now we move on to the biggest challenge of this kit, and it wasn't anything to do with the build, but the paint colors. Let me tell you right now, if you want to make new and exciting friends, ask about Japanese aircraft colors and there'll be no shortage of people messaging you, replying to posts, telling you you're wrong and why they're right. It all started with just the Atoki and what was the proper color. When I did my first zero, I used Mr. Colors Atoki Green, and it was too flaky and too large for pigments. So this time around, I used their silver color as the base, and simply mixed green and blue clear to make the proper tint. Don't let anyone tell you your Atoki Green is wrong though, because here's a reference of nine different pieces of metal, all with Atoki. Take your pick. I used my usual method of sandwich shading to make the cockpit color more interesting. And the whole idea here is to break up the tones underneath your blend coat, just to add some more character to the paint. Using grays or whites will make a difference, but if you really want to get nuts, add in some different colors like yellows or browns and see what happens. It's all fun, it's all experimenting. Because I was using the look panels that were pre-painted from Edward, I had to tint the interior green color a little bit just to have a closer match, and I just used some Eero Gray to do that. After the base painting was laid down, it was time to come in and start painting the instrument panels, radio boxes, and all the fun little details that make the cockpit interesting. I usually use Vallejo model color for this because they're high pigment paints and they usually brush on very well. I've also been using AK 3rd gen acrylics for metal colors. Once everything is painted, I then come in with some panel line wash just to mute all the bright colors and bring out the detail. A brown wash is usually dark enough to be used with a green interior color. Black turns out to be too harsh. By using an enamel-based wash, I can put this right on top of the acrylic colors and not have to worry about the paint lifting or mixing. Then everything is cleaned up with some enamel odorless thinner. 
You can leave the wash in place and have a really filthy cockpit, or you can remove a lot of it to have it look a little more tidy. It's just one of those great mediums that lets you really change the character of the model. I enhanced the look of the glass gauges on the look panel by adding some Tamiya clear just to make them really pop. The only downfall with the Edward look panels is the sides are black so you have to come up with a custom mix of paint to try to match it as closely as possible. It was fantastic that Edward included the look panels and space stuff to really enhance this model, but I can guarantee you that if you pick up the Profi Pack or even the Weekend Edition you won't be disappointed with the detail in this kit. I would definitely rate the cockpit detail on this kit a lot higher than the Mustang which I previously built. And overall I would rate this kit the best one that Edwards put out. The detail is very crisply done and you can really go to town if you're someone that likes super detailing to take it to the next level. And it's also not that difficult of a kit so anyone can build it. Here's where tears are usually shed though as a lot of that detail and work gets buried by the sidewalls so let's just take a minute and appreciate the work that Edwards put in here. Like I stated earlier, I didn't assemble the cockpit following the instructions. Instead of installing it from the bottom of the fuselage assembly as a plug, I chose to build everything off one side of the fuselage and then close it with the other. I simply used tweezers to make sure the floor panel was aligned with both fuselage halves before committing to glue. Again, the fit on this kit is really nice and there's only a few little areas that need some cleanup after assembly. Just look at how nice these panel plugs go into place. There's only three areas that need to be cleaned up and that's just from the natural assembly of the kit. One of those is above the gun access panels on the nose, where this fuselage seams come together behind the cockpit, and then where the wing comes into place, and that's more of a personal preference. Why am I using super glue in one area and then perfect plastic putty in another? Well it's simple, the super glue area is going to get a lot of sanding and work, but there's no detail I'm going to lose when I'm working that area. But the area where the plastic putty is going, there's a lot of rivet detail and a panel line. So by using that putty, I can simply wipe it away and not lose any of the detail in the surrounding area. While that was all drying, I then go to work the rear fuselage seam. And this is the only area where the sanding sticks really come into play. Where the fuselage tops curve inwards, you do lose the crispness of the rivet detail, but you have to sand this area down anyways to clean up the seam. It's also not that difficult to re-add the rivets using a riveting tool. Now it's time that the super glue is dried enough to clean up the joint over the gun access panels. When sanding this kind of detail, I like to start with an 800 grit sanding stick and then work my way up to 4000 grit. With the seam cleaned up, it's now time to re-add the rivets with the riveting wheel. Unlike the Mustang and Spitfire that needs a little bit of work getting the wings to line up properly, they click into place onto this zero and I was really surprised. There is no filler on the wing join needed at all. Happy with the alignment, I then committed everything to place with glue. Even the rear section of the wing fits into place with no issue. Noted that I also painted the wheel base with a Toki, which is actually incorrect for a Mitsubishi Zero. Now the icing on the cake for this kit is the cowling assembly. Normally a manufacturer would build this as one piece or two pieces, or like Hasegawa when they did their P47, four pieces. But Edward does a multi-part build as well, but they include a jig. And the nice thing about the jig, and by molding four parts separately to the cowling, you get to keep all of that super nice detail that they've put in place. And it all drops into place using that jig. The advice I give here though is make sure your sprues are cleaned up nicely, or else you're gonna run into a little bit of fit issues. Otherwise, this goes together really cleanly. Again, I'm using super glue to clean up the seam where the wings and fuselage come together. This fits really well, but there's still a hint of a seam there. The only place on this kit that I had to actually use some putty to clean up a join was on the bottom of the horizontal stabilizers. And this really isn't a bad area to have to clean up because you're never really going to see this. It was just a matter of packing in some perfect plastic putty again and then wiping it away with a moist cotton bud. Using the photo etch pieces I was able to get the secondary gun sight in place as well on the first try. Being someone who likes to paint the inside of a canopy before the outside, I love these T-face masks from Edward because they allow you to mask the inside of the canopy. Usually I would have to trace the outside, cut it, and then flip it to the inside, but this makes the whole process very streamlined and very easy. 
When removing the interior mask, I highly recommend using a toothpick or something blunt, that way you don't risk scratching the plastic. Now for the most controversial part of any Japanese aircraft build, and that is the exterior color. People go nuts over Dunkelgelb and German Grey, what's the most accurate shade? But the Japanese aircraft guys have found a way to take this to a whole nother level. I had five different people telling me five different sources that they had for the correct color and what they thought was appropriate. And this went as far as people actually messaging me privately on Facebook to tell me I was wrong. So what I ended up doing was going to jaircraft.com to start my research for the zero color and then having a few samples sent to me by a person who wished to remain anonymous. And I liked that because they weren't looking to be known as someone that had all the answers. They weren't pushing their ideas or what they thought was right. They simply said, here's the samples I have, make your best choice. I've also noticed that in the next release of this kit, the A6M2, that Edward has also tweaked the mix they call for for their gray for the zero. And surprisingly, it seems like they flipped the same way I did. I'm in no way trying to take credit for that because I had no contact with Edward at all about colors. I was just posting what I was doing online. So it's kind of cool to see that their research that they've revisited almost falls in line with what I chose to do. Once again, I am not claiming to be an expert at this at all. If you feel a great zero should be more gray or more white, have at it, it's your model. You just need to be the one happy with it in the end. I'm never gonna be that person that tells you that you are right or that you are wrong. All I can say is that the first mix that Edward had for the beige for the zero just seemed too brown and too dark to me, but that was my own choice. I'm sure there are other people that would interpret that as correct. At least one of the five people did. I chose to do some light weathering on this aircraft, so this would be after the Pearl Harbor strike, because clean aircraft generally don't interest me. I'd like them to have a little bit of weathering because that brings some character to the build. And this aircraft was in service to at least midway. So if you're about to type into the comments section that this aircraft wasn't this beat up at Pearl Harbor and was brand new, please don't. I'm aware of that. I've just chosen the model of the aircraft later in its service life. And as someone who likes to flog their aircraft models, this was a challenge to do something this restricted. Because there was so much controversy over what was the right color for the Zero, I chose to stir things up a little bit more by using the white stripes on the aircraft. I found that that made the overall color really pop. I chose to paint the markings on because I found that the red used in the decals were a little too orange and didn't match some of the references I was finding. And the nice thing about Japanese markings is they're very easy to mask and paint on. As I stated earlier, there are 12 different aircraft in this kit that you can pick to model and they all have different stripes on the tails. So there's a lot of freedom in what you choose to do. I did cheat when making the stripes for the tails and what I did was use my silhouette cutter and put all the measurements in there to build the lines and to set up spacing. It took about three hours to have everything measured properly and about 15 minutes to shoot the paint. Now why am I choosing to do all this rather than use the decals? That's simple. The last time I used the Edward decals I had issues with them on the Spitfire and the Mustang and by trying to peel the carrier film away I ended up tearing the decals. Now I'm not sure if Edwards changed the way they've done the decals for the Zero, but by using Mark Softer and Setter and a clear coat and a little more practice, I was actually able to remove the carrier film from all the decals on this model without damaging the decal itself. I also noticed this time around that the decals sat a lot nicer than they did the first time with this Mustang and Spit. So should you choose to not remove the carrier film, you're still going to have a nice looking model. Temptation to peel them away though is still there because then they look like they've been painted on. So should you choose to go this route, make sure you practice with some smaller decals before you try it on the model itself. The nice thing about a clear coat like I've done this time around is that should you have anything go wrong, you can lightly sand the decal away. Just make sure you're lifting the carrier film and not the decal itself when you're trying to peel it. The last things to come together for this kit were the engine and the landing gear. And the engine is very nicely detailed and I chose to put some ignition wires on using lead wire. The only problem is when you put the engine cowling on and then the spinner, you don't really see any of the engine so that might have been a little bit of a waste of time. But again, you never know if someone will look closely enough to see if they can find that type of detail and I personally like doing that. By painting the propeller with a lacquer color and then spraying the rear with an acrylic color, I didn't have to worry about masking too much as the acrylic was very easy to clean up with a toothpick and to give it a little bit of wear and tear. I do have the proper Mr. Color propeller color, 
but I found that the Tamiya Red Brown Acrylic was a very close match as well. And it's just easier to work with if you're going the beat up route. The reference I found for the engine showed it is mostly black, so I tried to break it up with some different shades and glazes. But again, this is all going to get buried by the cowling, so choose your battles. The nice thing about not using an absolute black for the engine paint is that the panel liner black does make all the details pop quite a bit. That's why I always recommend that you don't use flat black for a black color, because when it comes to weathering, you still have some wiggle room on what you can do with oils and colors. For the chrome look of the cylinders for the landing gear, I used a Molotov chrome pen and a little bit of lacquer thinner just to be able to brush that on. Just make sure you really reference the instructions when you saw the landing gear because the legs don't sit at a 90 degree angle. They're actually canted inwards quite a bit. Edward also sent me some resin wheels with the sample to use on the kit and they're very nicely done. The Japanese lettering on the side wall is very tight and really comes to life with a wash and they drop right onto the landing gear with no fit issues. Now that all the painting and decals were in place, I sealed everything with a flat clear. And the reason I'm using a flat clear is that it really holds the wash and holds any oils I use and makes it easier to blend them. The side effect of using a flat clear is it can be very hard to remove the oils, such as when you paint the entire thing with a wash. So just keep that in mind, and you just might have to use a dampened shop towel, some thinner, to remove the excess. I found that that same brown wash used for German yellow camouflage worked really well with the beige and made the color pop even more. I'm going to bring this build to a close. I just want to take a moment to thank my patrons again for supporting my work and what I'm doing. It really means a lot and allows me to do more. And I also wanted to take a moment to thank Edward for providing this kit. It was a very exciting opportunity to have access to a sample and be able to build it for a review. And I really appreciate the chance to do that. It was very humbling and I really enjoyed the kit. There was really nothing wrong with it, building it, and anybody that's looking at it, I highly recommend this kit. You won't be disappointed at all. I'd also like to say thank you to the viewers that have watched this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you like the content of this channel, please click like, click subscribe, and leave a comment section in the below. If you enjoy Edward, what kits you've enjoyed from them, what you'd like to see them release, put it below. That feedback is always great and it helps me bring you better content. And we might even see a model maker find that information and choose to run with it. I know a year ago that if someone made a comment like Edward should do the entire line of zeros, there would have been a lot of laughing, but look where it is now. It's here and it's coming. Maybe a comment you make inspires them for the next line of aircraft. Like maybe a Harvard. Model guy and I'll see you next time.